17 Anima Working Group meeting. This is the note wheel. Everybody should know it and behave and obey it. Mm. And uh, please do sign uh, to the session, particularly when you're on site using the, also the meeting echo uh, from the data tracker agenda. Uh, and you must uh, join the Mac uh, queue before, uh, before that, use the meeting echo first, uh, then you can join the Mac on site. Um, yeah, for the, from this time, uh, there's no request for mask on site. Uh, and uh, for the remote participant, make sure your audio and video are off unless you are sharing or presenting uh, something. Okay, um, the agenda already on, on the online. We also upload all those materials, slides on the uh, ITF website, so they can all be downloaded. Um, this session is shared by Teres and me, Xinjiang, um, and uh, also we have the secretary, uh, Michael Richardson. Um, we have the uh, on-site minutes taker. Uh, who's that, Teres? Ben Harkins, it's already in the notes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. So um, as an IETF working group, we I ask everybody uh, who submit a draft to Anima working group to disclose your IPRs as early as possible. Uh, otherwise, yeah, but, uh, your you IPR may be... Um, so your slides are moving. No, your slides I are did. moving. So, okay. Does anybody see the slides moving? No. Nope. Do you want me to share the slides? Maybe. Uh, Oops. There's... Then you take over. So that may not good for the remote. Yep. I stopped. Yep. So let's see which slide were you. We not well. We've got this one. Resource. Do you see the uh, slides that I'm sharing? Yeah, I see it. Um, okay. Next page. Next, page. next. IPR, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, all the um, participants submit a draft uh, are asked to uh, disclose IPR as early as possible. Otherwise, your IPR may be, uh, get uh, invalid. Uh, next page. Hmm, I guess yep. you can take care from here, Candice. Yep. <laughs> anyway. Right. So we'll stay a couple of hours on this one. <laughs> so uh, the uh, Brewski set of uh, documents are currently the uh, most active ones being worked on. And uh, I wanted to go through here and see, um, you know, what uh, process-wise the next checks are that we can do. And uh, the stage is that we are in there. Two more slides um, going into some of the details. So we're going to have slots for Brewski AE, the um, alternative enrollment protocols, so stuff other than EST um, from ID995. Um, Brewski um, pledge responder mode um, and uh, the uh, JWS voucher. Um, so for the others, we don't have slots. And so uh, in IETF 116, we explained a little bit um, how uh, these are uh, to some extent uh, depending on each other. So we're going to have uh, one more cluster. Um, and so we're working sequentially through them. And so I think one of the goals is to get a EPRM voucher out um, as, uh, uh, as soon as we can toward working group last call. They, they already are in working group last call and that um, basically unveiled um, a lot of uh, issue that, that we have been fixing on to, to a large extent and you'll hear more about that in the slots. Um, we've got Brewski Cloud, um, and that's quite interesting because somebody felt it was a great idea to make it a normative reference um, in some non-anima work, and now we have a cluster waiting for it. And so we have one open issue on that, which uh, Michael hopefully can close very soon. And then we're going to do Shepherd review working group last call. So hopefully 
will um, avoid uh, having uh, a non-anamark cluster waiting for um, for any reason uh, for any amount of time on it. But there is a um, little bit of work done, but no update. I think that's uh, been felt worth by the authors to uh, have a slot in here. Um, constraint proxy and constraint voucher, they go together. And uh, while there have been some um, small uh, work being done on, on, on some items, item right now I would say they're in the queue after AE, PRM, and voucher for um, the authors and as well um, for us as the shepherds uh, reviewing them and helping with the input on them. So, but uh, they're, they're going to be actively closed. Uh, uh, it's purely based on the cycles of all the involved parties here. Um, we've got RFC 8366 BIS, um, and that was actually the solution of all our Yang problems. So this is the dumping ground for the Yang from um, all the other RFCs, uh, all the other drafts uh, here. Um, and uh, that, that hasn't actually needed any update. And um, so I was putting in red here um, one question that I was thinking of, uh, should we already start having an early Yang doctor review at that stage in time? Uh, Michael, for example, or anybody else having an opinion on that? Oh, wow. Um, I, uh, Robertson, Cisco, uh, as a Navy, yes, I would say, yes, get it out and get early reviews are always better. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, I, it's not, if I remember recall, it's not particularly long, is it, in terms of the updates and things? Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, I have to admit, I haven't looked into it recently, so. Okay. Okay. So, and then the voucher delegation. So that's been lying around due to lack of cycles and interest for a while. And so I try to utilize the tooling that we have and there is the parking spot and the meter is right now in the notes set to run out when uh, the other drafts here um, have been moved on from the working group, then we can revisit if there is uh, interest um, and, uh, and the cycles from uh, the current co-authors. So, so I explained the Brewski cluster. Um, so one other um, tooling step where I was actually, you know, also looking for AD input um, when we, ha we had done a lot of uh, early reviews and uh, got great feedback for um, several of the Brewski drafts. And uh, I think the authors were all claiming that the issues raised were resolved. But uh, if you look into data tracker, there is no way for us as the working group participants um, to actually change the status of these um, uh, early reviews. So if you go to the data tracker page, you'll see a lot of wonderful different colors, red and blue and all these uh, not really um, ready to go uh, out, out of the working group for these. So um, I was talking with the tooling people and it seems the only way to, to get an update to the color is to simply re-raise the early review, ask that the same reviewer uh, simply checks off that um, all the concerns that they had were uh, being solved and then we get a green and that hopefully helps to accelerate uh, the process starting with the AD review and further on into uh, IETF review that uh, all these early reviews are really marked green. Opinions on that, uh, Rob? Just a uh, head nod? Uh, yes. Okay. Sorry, just uh, quickly taking notes, and this is an AI for me, so. Okay, so I'll do that. So then we've got uh, two um, documents uh, uh, in, in working group uh, status that uh, are not related to Brewski. And so we talked uh, with the authors. So the first one um, uh, from where Michael provided a lot of feedback. So they've uh, asked for more time until IETF 118 to do an update and fix the issues. And um, 
on the um, second one, the auto deployment, I provided uh, some sh uh, shepherd review to the authors. And uh, so they're going to reconsider what to do with the document because it needs to evolve into either one of two possible directions with some good amount of work before I think it could, could go uh, progress in the working group. So, so no updates on these two uh, documents here. Um, what else do we have today on the agenda? So um, I wanted to talk um, about the discovery issues that we have across the Brewski drafts that we're working on and some um, starting point of the proposal. Hopefully we'll get also, you know, some, some good for, for text for that quickly through. And then on the non-working group draft slots, um, the uh, ANI auto configuration via DNS, um, and then a new proposal certification, certificate-less enrollment protocol in Brewski. Um, and if there is any, you know, agenda bashing, if you folks would like to see anything change, please uh, yell up now before I finish uh, with this uh, uh, chair slide deck, um, and uh, then we can still update the agenda as needed. So um, shepherding, I think right now we're fine with, with, the, with the documents. If anybody wants to help us, uh, shares especially uh, with the uh, uh, documents we were our shepherds, we're always happy to, to um, kind of offload more work to uh, working group members. So if you want to uh, gain uh, training points here in the IETF for shepherding, uh, it's, it's, it's never too late. Please uh, contact uh, Sheng and I. Um, as far as uh, discussions and so on, I think this, this time we're pretty lightweight uh, on the agenda, so hopefully we will have some good discussions on the technical details. I'd also had uh, some concern raised um, for, for the last IETFs to please reduce the amount of status updates uh, and concentrate on the open issues in the uh, slots uh, on, on the talking so that uh, we use the um, interactive time here in the meeting most productively. And uh, if there's more time needed for any issue, um, it's it's easy to set up interims to, to get more discussion time. And of course, for Brewski, we have the weekly meeting, um, which is uh, on uh, Tuesdays, uh, 11 to 12 AM Eastern Time Toronto on the URL listed here on the slide. And uh, tooling reminder, yeah, so we have a GitHub, which is uh, hosting any um, individual or working group document for uh, animal related work. So please feel free to use that for anything that you are proposing to um, anima and also for any of the working group documents. Uh, it's ideal to not only uh, discuss issues on the mailing list, but also to open them up as issues on the GitHub so that we'll tracking how they get resolved. And I think that has already shown to be highly valuable for the uh, Brewski working group documents that we're currently um, working on. And that is it. So we're through with the first item on the agenda. And I think that means we're now going to David on Brewski AE. Yes. David, can you hear? Yep, we can hear you. Um, do you want to share the slides yourself or uh, do you want me to uh, show them? I prefer and you to share, share the slides. Okay, let me a new slide deck then. Yeah, thank you. Now they're up. <clears throat> so I'm going to give a quick update um, on Brewski AE, so the alternative enrollments protocol in Brewski. Uh, we are currently at version of five and yeah and with that i think we can go to this next slide yeah since last ietf uh, just after that um, we at the end of the working group last call and uh, during the last call we only got one minor very minor comment on how to, yeah, how to sw switch to a different reference format for um, a different URL for our nice picture. Um, this, of course, was easy to do. Um, we also got some Shepherd review comments uh, from Torles. And what you can see uh, in the list is the, slide, um, is the change that we done. So they are all editorial, uh, introducing um, abbreviations, uh, tweaking some terms and, and the like. 
um, making really uh, prominent that uh, the CMP uh, part uh, normatively refers to the light byte CMP profile. Yeah, so all, <clears throat> so no content changes at uh, this time, no, uh, no real additions content-wise. And uh, I think it is not uh, necessary to go into these pretty details here. Um, so we can go to the next slide, which is essentially my last one. Um, so the status is the reckoning rule last call has passed and also Tyler uh, has already given the document shepherd write up. And basically the document would now be ready for AD review. However, um, as uh, Tyler has mentioned, a um, more general problem, uh, pro um, problem came up with all these new boost key variants that it would be good to have a way of uh, announcing and, uh, and discovering uh, the new features. In this case, uh, the, the use of uh, a different and ROM protocol um, from the registrar. Um, so here, the main thing would be that if such a mechanism is available, um, the client could check if uh, the registrar is able to speak to a CMP variant um, of Brusky or Brusky AE. And this is the thing, the only thing missing from our perspective uh, from the draft. And I'm very happy that we are going to have a discussion today on how to do this in general, because it also affects the other um, Brusky variants like PRM, uh, which also will be mentioned by Stefan, I guess. Yeah, that's basically all um, I have planned to share with you. And of course, I'm open to questions and comments. Yeah, so maybe quickly from my side, the comments. So um, in whatever role you ask me, individual contributor or working group chair or something like that, I always consider that any of these protocol services that we're doing in Anima um, meaning that they should be self-configuring, and that really means that I always think that uh, the discovery uh, of the you know communication peer for any of these protocols is part of the problem that the draft should be solving, and that manual configuration of them um, is maybe good enough for um, some uh, prototyping, but not for specification. And that's why I wanted to make sure that we do um, resolve the discovery uh, problems for uh, these variations in Brewski. And so mm -hmm. um, in, in the um, meetings that we had, um, I was starting to propose text for that um, into the different documents. And then I think we got to the point of saying, well, it's not entirely clear that there is a single good place to put it. And spreading it out is also a problem. So that's exactly one of the uh, things we're going to discuss later uh, in the session. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have anybody else here in queue? Questions, suggestions, anything on the chat? <laughs> so. Right, um, I think then we can go to the next slot. Yep. So that's likely me. Yep. So I use this uh, request slides. So if you open yeah. them, I probably can drive them from my machine, but uh, I can also say next slide, whatever you want. Well, we'll try to share them yourself. Well, always want to empower people here with the tooling. <laughs> I know, I, I, I asked that you can share it. So that's the share slide request. Oh, there we go, got it, yep. So that is, um, wait. JWS is the first one. <clears throat> yep, I would like to give an update, a short update on the JWS sign vouchers. I'm doing that on behalf of Thomas because Thomas is uh, not available today. So the draft uh, hasn't been updated since the last IETF meeting in March. Uh, Shepard for that draft is Matthias Kovac. And we already got the, the write-up 
uh, for that draft. Okay, so just to, to recall, what is the draft about? Um, RFC 8366, which is currently in, in this status, specifies a CMS sign JSON uh, for, for voucher artifacts as encoding. Uh, in the draft JWS voucher, the goal is to have a JWS sign JSON element. Uh, so that's basically the uh, gist out of that document. The document itself makes no changes to young. So it uh, just keeps the voucher as is and uh, utilizes a different encoding. Or, yeah. So as I said, no changes since uh, ITF 116. Uh, we have, uh, based on the Shepard review and based on the uh, working group last call review that was uh, done after, uh, actually before, after uh, the last ITF meeting, um, there was a request that JWS voucher itself should not update RFC 8366. Uh, so that means uh, there was a proposal to remove the update flag from, from the draft and uh, also to have some proposed text that is to be included in the next version of the draft. So that means uh, it's an explanation that RFC 8366 defines a CMS signed JSON voucher artifact and that uh, the voucher is defined via the young in the uh, in, in 8366 and CMS is a signature format that is used for uh, the defined voucher and uh, contrary and JSON uh, signed JSON voucher artifact, uh, the voucher is still in Yang, but uh, here we use a, JSON, a JWS signature for it. So that text will be included in the next version. We also meanwhile got some Shepard write-up from Osias uh, regarding specifically the examples and how the examples are formatted in the document. Uh, that's also going to be incorporated. And then uh, the IANA registration for the type value definition of voucher JWS JSON needs to be done. Okay, so the next steps are basically uh, addressing the remaining open issues that were mentioned on the slide before. Then uh, the Shepard write up from Matthias has already been circulated and uh, it's going to be addressed also in one of the next versions of the uh, of the draft. So that's more or less editorial changes in the draft to make the the uh, JSON examples that are contained better readable. <clears throat> so interop testing, as for the last ITF meetings, is still welcome. Uh, that uh, makes sense to make that in combination with Brewski PRM because uh, Brewski PRM completely relies on the JWS voucher uh, format and utilize that, this format also for the, for the other messages that are changed or that are exchanged in uh, Brewski PRM. Yeah, and uh, when, when this is done, then we can start with the finalization of the document in terms of uh, bringing it to AD review. So from, I, I just double checked the, the uh, data tracker and in the data tracker, uh, no early review has been done on the document. So it's a, it's a fairly uh, small document. It's just a couple of pages defining this new encoding. So I think that was a reason to not have any early review of that. Uh, and when the changes are done based on the, on the Shepard write-up, then I said it can proceed to AD review. Okay, we're set. Yeah, so uh, one, thank you very much. Um, one, uh, one question to, to early reviews, is, the, is there any particular single top early review that would make sense, if any? I mean, um, given how we have the mutual dependencies, these uh, things will uh, move together. So just uh, right now we could use the time without uh, incurring delay. So as just the encoding changes for the voucher, I'm, I'm not quite sure if there is any early review necessary. Okay. So at least not, not that I can think of. So young uh, makes no sense because there is no young contained in the document. Uh, SecAD, uh, we, we just utilizing the JWS, uh, 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 so the JSON signature 
web signature. Um, so it's a straightforward use and yeah, I, I, I don't see a reason for an early review there. On the open issue, did you want to kind of um, open the open issues here for discussion while we're here? Um, is, is there any specific things you'd like to get feedback here from, from the room or for, from? So the open issue is just this one here. So the IANA registration is more a type of doing doing it, basically applying for, for that or doing the early registration uh, at IANA. So this is something, uh, not quite sure if Michael jumps in there or if Thomas is going to do that, but uh, that's more a doing thing. And the other here is the proposal from the working group last call where we essentially said, okay, we will remove the update and include the proposed text. Uh, so also not not much to discuss about that, I think. Okay. So, so really nothing which is unclear on how to resolve, just uh, the work still needs to be done. Yep. Yeah. So, the, the IANA registration, I think when I when I read the uh, uh, issue log here on uh, GitHub, that um, seems like in, in the similar case, they, they wanted these things to only be done um, after working group last call or with working group last call. Um, so let me know, right? I mean, uh, if, if for implementation purposes, you like to have this as uh, early as possible, then I, I can certainly try to uh, see if we can accelerate that. But otherwise, I think we'd stick mm -hmm. with the same timeline as uh, as here. OK, uh, given the fact that the working group last call has already passed, uh, so we would uh, qualify for that. Uh... OK. <clears throat> OK. So so does that mean I should put on my list of items to, to do the, um, the registration ask? That would be great. Okay. So then I think we are done mm -hmm. with JWS voucher and I would do the same trick and basically request us to share slides. That works quite well. Uh, here I'm there it is. Okay, so I also try to to make it crisp here and and, and short to uh, yeah basically give an overview about the main changes. So um, the the draft itself is in version 09 currently. So 08 was a version uh, after uh, be, before uh, the last ITF meeting. So we had the working group last call in between. And uh, so there are some, some we, we, we got quite a lot of comments and most of the comments were related to improving the, the structure of the document, improving uh, or clarifying the terminology. All of those things uh, I, I simply summarized here in the first bullet point because uh, there, there were no really technical issues there. So we had technical issues or technical comments that related to, to mainly three different points here. One was the support of an additional or an optional TLS protection of the communication between the registrar. So I put the picture up here because I think it's easier to, to understand then. So between the registrar agent here and, and the pledge. So up to now, we, we did not have, uh, or we, we didn't take TLS into account because we would like to have uh, here, the freedom of choice regarding the, the uh, communication means that are used between the pledge and the registrar agent. So right now, the draft is concentrating on, on normal uh, HTTP connections, but it could also be done over Bluetooth or over uh, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy or over NFC. So therefore, we had the, uh, we, we used here uh, self-contained uh, secure object. So that means that on, on the uh, application layer, the messages were were secured uh, and there was no need seen for an underlying TLS connection. Nevertheless, 
for specifically for the scenarios where we use where we use HTTP. Uh, it makes sense to to utilize HTTP over TLS, and for that we enhanced. Uh, uh, the different sections here, section four and six point one, and also provided in NXB some clarifications on how to utilize the IDFID certificate as a server side certificate for TLS, because uh, PRM uh, reverses the communication direction from the pledge to the to the registrar or to the registrar agent here, um, under the assumption that the pledge is acting as a server and not as a client. So it's, it sits in the network and, and waits to be triggered for certain actions. So this uh, utilization of TLS addresses several of the privacy-related issues that have been raised and was also consequently been added in the privacy and security considerations. So we are uh, in, in the GitHub, as, as Tolles said, in the GitHub there is this issue tracking of the different uh, issues that are related with that. Uh, so there are specifically the TLS related issues, I, I left them open uh, to have a further review from you, Tolles. Um, but besides that, and based on the discussion that we had in the design team, uh, those issues are addressed and are more or less finalized and can be closed. So then we had uh, another technical comment that uh, led to an option to, that also a separate HTTP connection may be used to provide the pledge enrollment request uh, between the registrar agent and the, and the domain registrar uh, that is used for repeated or delayed enrollment attempts. So that led to some changes in section 626. And then uh, the last comment that was uh, treated as a technical comment was uh, we, we used to have yeah, quite long names for the endpoints uh, that are defined on the pledge side and also the additional endpoints that we defined on the domain register side to be able to uh, yeah, cope with uh, with the signed objects that we use for uh, the certificate enrollment as well as for the uh, fetching of CA certificates. And those endpoints have been shortened here. So for instance, the trigger pledge uh, vouch request creation uh, that has been shortened to TPVR, uh, so that was much longer before. So that was being done to also take constraint devices into account, so that means we concentrated on the pledge side here and uh, provided the renaming of the endpoints mainly for the pledge on that side. So those are the main changes be uh, besides the topics that we also had for uh, Brewski AE. Uh, so actually, the, the discussion about the discovery came up in Brewski PRM and then was somehow spread to Brewski AE um, because uh, the discovery that we have so far in Brewski, it, it's just the discovery of a Brewski register, but not really about uh, what functionality does the register provide. And specifically in the PRM case, as we are reversing the communication direction between the pledge and the registrar or the registrar agent, this is something that needs to be announced or that, that needs to be discoverable. Uh, so that started the discussion on the on the discovery. And uh, yeah, I, I left it open here. So you see that that's uh, issue 79, uh, where the intention is to discover a registrar with a different feature set. So that means that the feature set would differ in a way that we are using a voucher that is not CMS uh, encoded or not CMS signed, uh, but we use JWS uh, instead, then uh, we have a registrar that is uh, a pledge that is working in, in responder mode, uh, which is in contrast to, to uh, standard Brewski where the registrar is in responder mode. So this is another issue that, or another item that would need to be uh, signaled during the discovery to make the pledge aware that there's a uh, registrar with a certain functionality available. And in terms of uh, Brewski AE, we would signal that there is a different enrollment protocol used. So uh, the lightweight CMP profile instead of EST. So those are the different uh, the different parameters we, we were currently discussing in the, in the design team. And uh, Torles uh, already mentioned that he made some 
some proposals uh, for Brewski PRM and also for Brewski AE, uh, which we are currently discussing in a way to, to have them separate because they are not, not specific to either of the drafts, but it's some kind of base functionality and maybe some kind of enhancement of the standard Brewski to basically be able to signal um, you know, those parameters in addition to just discovering the registrar. So those are, uh, those are the, the open issues. Essentially, then we have some further clarification in, um, in, in the specification itself. So we, we just opened up three new uh, open issues that target clarification. Um, it's, it's more an editorial thing. It's, it's not really, uh, it, it doesn't lead to any technical changes in the, in the document itself. So then uh, the shepherd, uh, Matthias, he, he also indicated that he would uh, provide some help in restructuring section five and section six. So those are the ones that are describing the interaction of the pledge with a, with a um, registrar agent and from the registrar agent to the registrar uh, to make it better readable. And once this is done, jump to the next slide. Uh, so that's, that's ongoing uh, to have the remaining open issues being clarified. So there are, uh, I just looked it up, 11 remaining open issues and uh, more or less all of them have been addressed so far and we just need to align and agree upon the solution proposal. Then as uh, also during the last ITF meetings, interop testing is welcome and uh, there are POC implementations of all the different com components available. And if there is interest in doing an interop test, then please get in touch with that. What's uh, regarding the status of the docu document, the Shepard write-up uh, would be the next step then. And then uh, as for the other documents, we can go to AD review. Regarding the early reviews that we have for Brewski PRM, uh, the Sectier review that was done uh, indicated uh, is, indicates blue. So that means that uh, some nits have been found uh, they have been addressed because that was at the at very earlier stage uh, of the document. And that would be one question because you mentioned that in the, in the introduction, Thomas. Uh, do we have to get back to the SEC tier to, to basically ask for a re-review? And if they feel that the points have been addressed, that would be question number one. Question number two would be, would that be necessary for NITs? Or would that only be necessary for uh, the things that we have seen in Ruski AE, where we have a yellow state, meaning that it has issues from a sector point of view, and from a young doctor's point of view, there was a statement that it is not ready. Meanwhile, everything that has to do with young was removed uh, from AE and also from PRM. So I don't think there are any issues with, with young. No, no, I mean, the Yang stuff obviously would be the most easy thing in terms of can I, I'll, I'll open up uh, the um, early review request and in the notes mm -hmm. I'm writing, uh, please give it to the same reviewer. There okay. is no Yang anymore. This is mm -hmm. uh, inapplicable. Please mark it as green. And if you really like to review um, that Yang code, it's gone to the other document and would be happy to have you do a review there as well. But uh, at that point in time here, um, it's, it's not clear to me. Uh, no, no, we, we wanted to have the early review for the other document anyhow was the note mm -hmm. that I took. So, so I'll do that anyhow. So then the whole, okay. the whole point is just, we don't have to do any of this, but it seems to be something which we can now do in parallel with closing any of the other issues like the discovery, which will take a little while. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're not losing time in getting all the early reviews changed to green. And that would hopefully then help in the further stages. So yeah, yeah. No, I think it's good. I mean, as, as we have uh, normative dependencies, most likely, at least for PRM, we have a normative dependency on RFC 8366 BIS because it relies on the young model that is defined there. Uh, right. So it's it's fine to have the, the sector review again to, to basically see if we address the nits that have been found there. So did okay. the found, found found issue related to the Yang stuff? I'm, I'm just curious. I, I... No, 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 no. We had we had uh, two two things. One was uh, the Yang Doctor review, uh, 
during the time as the Yang module was still part of, well, first of AE, and then we had to split up. Uh, and the sec tier, no, they didn't find anything regarding regarding Yang. Okay, fine. Good. Uh, any uh, questions, suggestions, room, audience remote, please? Yell up or be forever quiet until the next slot. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, and then, so I think that finishes. No, the, the this this is actually right. So uh, I think it's me. Okay. Okay, so um, we heard from two of the drafts uh, where um, we stumbled across the um, discovery variations, but I think uh, there, there, there are more of them. Um, so um, let's say the most simple generic um, initial problem is network has multiple registrars. They support different subsets of Ruski variations. And how would a pledge get to the registrar supporting what the pledge supports? And um, some distinction we can resolve already. So um, uh, purely um, by the fact that uh, the existing discovery that we have would indicate the transport protocol. So TCP uh, being part of the announcement that we have in GRASP or DNSSD. Um, and that means um, all the Brewski variations other than constrained Brewski could be distinguished from the constraint Brewski, which uses UDP, which indicates co-op uh, DTLS, or uh, in GRASP it actually is uh, more specific than UDP. So some distinction we already have, but that's not good enough, right? And um, if we look at it, here is um, uh, the pieces that we can't distinguish right now, and they're written down in the way that um, I was proposing to also capture this um, in the document and uh, making this become a registry in IANA um, under the Brewski parameters as the Brewski variation parameters. Um, so at this point in time in the design team, we figured out there are three type of um, variations. I, I call them parameter right now. Maybe it should be called type of variation. So one is the mode in which the overall enrollment is uh, working and we have the two variations of what we're calling here the registrar responder mode. Um, uh, and uh, the other one is the pledge responder mode, which uh, Brewski PRM introduces. Um, we've got the um, enrollment protocol, which basically is the protocol that is run after the initial Brewski part. So it's the tail end when you are requesting um, the keying material and um, your own certificate. Um, and Brewski uses EST for that, 7030. Um, and uh, Brewski AE, um, for example, describes the general mechanisms for many of them, um, but it pretty much um, standardizes uh, together with the lightweight uh, CMP protocol draft. Uh, one option, which uh, we, I think we can call CMP, it's actually lightweight CMP, but we always wanna have our strings be short. And then I also added one potential one just to show that uh, there could over time be a lot more variation. So one of the older protocols that um, was informationally documented in the IETF and has been used quite a bit in some parts of the industry is SEP, uh, Simple Certificate Enrollment Protocol. Um, uh, and I, I put the wrong RFC number there, sorry. It was a, so that <laughs> that is a, a different RFC number, sorry, back in the slide. Um, and then uh, the third uh, type of variation is the uh, format and coding of the voucher, where um, the original voucher RFC 8368 and therefore Brewski um, 8995 uh, is using the CMS encoding. And then um, the, uh, um, this draft would then also introduce the Jose, which is in the, ADL, in, in the JWS voucher draft. Um, and uh, so, so this is the starting point and uh, making that as a, a registry 
in IANA should therefore allow for uh, new variations to be added without creating dependencies between different drafts um, and therefore allowing, you know, to not have another cluster of things where we not know where to put stuff in the future. So this is a uh, slide is just uh, going through the, uh, the explanation that I was giving. So just for the people who look at the slide deck without me talking. Um, right, so if, if people are wondering uh, in PRM, the registrar is still also the responder. Um, so it is still necessary to discover the registrar in the same way as in classical Brewski. It's also, the pledge is also discoverable. Um, um, for, for that part of using this registry um, to discover variations in other service points, I have that on a different slide. Um, so, right, so I had two um, particular keywords in there, default and reserved. And so the idea of default was to specify for any of these parameters, let me go back here, um, one default fault value, which means that if you starting out with a discovery mechanism, and this is what we've done in Brewski, and you don't have a variation, and you discover it too late that, that you need to have variations on that, then you would simply call uh, that first mode default. And that means that if no uh, variation for the parameter is given, then it implies that for this parameter, the default value is what is being supported, right? So the old Brewski announcements uh, that we have for DNSSD or for GRASP, they wouldn't include um, this variation parameter. And that means, okay, that is announcement for the mode being um, default, which means registrar responder mode. It also means that the enrollment protocol is the default, which means EST. And it also means that the format of the voucher support is the default, which means CMS, right? So that, that way, you know, if you recognize too late that you're introducing variation, um, always, if nothing is announced from the parameters, it's the defaults for the parameters. And that way, all the existing discovery mechanisms that we have will be forward compatible um, with this variation signaling. And reserved is simply that, for example, for something like SEP, um, let's say we, so the idea was for the registry to be expert reviewed. So as the expert, we're kind of reserving a particular keyword to be used in conjunction with um, some particular RFC. But as long as there is no real full specification how to do that within uh, the Brewski environment, um, the value is not usable, but it's also not simply up for grabs for somebody who wants to try to do something incompatible with it. So there was a proposal to, to keep some sanity um, in uh, the um, uh, registry. Right, so then um, of course there is uh, to be documented the behavior of the proxies. Um, in Brewski, potentially any of the Brewski variations as well. Um, it is possible to use a uh, proxy. If you use the ANI with the ACP and devices that don't uh, have any form of DNS or any routable IP addresses uh, when they need to be bootstrapped, you must use a proxy. And so um, obviously uh, if you now have variations in there, the pledge, needs to discover from the announcement of the proxy which variation are, are being supported. And that means that the proxy is need to be able to receive the variation information in the uh, discovery mechanism from the registrar and announce them equally when it announces itself to the pledges. And then um, there is, of course, the interesting thing, what happens when you have registrars with some overlap in features so that um, the pledge needs to um, select um, which uh, registrar to use based on which uh, option um, or which uh, variation is required. Um, and that typically means you have for every um, variation um, combination, you need to put that on a separate socket. So when a pledge connects to you, you recognize from the socket from the port um, that the pledge connects to 
which variation it needs, and therefore, as a proxy, you can decide which uh, registrar uh, you're connecting to. So that's that's one of the beauties of uh, if you have freedom of choice, you have additional work in implementation. Right, so future parameters, I think the registry can well be uh, amended with parameters that may not apply to registrars and by implication to proxies for the registrar, but if at some point in time um, people see variations in, right now we don't have you know discovery specified for MASA, we have some form of a discovery specified for the pledges in Brewski PRM. Um, I don't see any need for a variation for pledges, but as soon as that comes up, we can equally add that as parameters in the same registry. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, we would just need in this text to specify um, what um, requirements are when you introduce a new parameter, right? So that you probably want to uh, define a default um, and then specify for which roles um, like registrar and proxy um, or pledges or MASA or whichever other Brewski role we may get to for which role this parameter applies to. Um, so that way we can hopefully get the most use for now and the future out of a single registry. So now we uh, have the issue of how do we take this consistent data model um, of variations um, and encode it into the different discovery mechanisms that we have. Um, so the, um, wait a second, was it the right order I'm trying to, I think, I think somehow there's, there's a misordering in the slide. Um, so, um, the, the DNS SD is typically um, a key equal value and a set of that. Um, and so um, ESCO made one very good uh, um, recommendation, which was that um, if we, and let me go back to that slide here. If we keep the variation strings unique across all the different parameters, then we don't need to signal the parameter at all it is good enough just to signal the variations that we have. So right now, all these variations have different strings. We would not allow to have for different parameters to have the same string values, right? These are all just keywords. So you simply, when you want to allocate a new variation in any mode, you need to come up with a uh, variation string that is not being used in the registry at all. And that means then the signaling that we need to do doesn't need to signal uh, any parameters, just the list of variations that are being supported and making the signaling uh, shorter, more compact, and easier. And that was what this slide was saying as well. So in DNS SD, you would simply be signaling a list of exactly these variations. Each of the variations is therefore um, a so-called key. and uh, it would be key equal one, and you can abbreviate that to just key. So that is the standard uh, DNS SD RFC signaling optimization when we consider every parameter in DNS SD to be a key um, in the um, text values. So in, in GRASP, that, that is uh, more interesting because um, Michael made a very strong point to keep the encoding as simple as possible. So um, here we have a typical AN proxy announcement from a proxy to the pledge. And where it says string here is the place where we could either through string or a more complex structure insert all the variation and other information that is missing in a current um, announcement. Right now, um, this string here would be empty, um, which would work, um, is backward compatible. That just means empty is default. Um, so then the question is, can we get away um, with a single string across all the possible variations? So first of all, there is no need to indicate more than one variation um, because you can always include multiple announcements here, right? So you can have 
um, multiple uh, in the same M flood, you have multiple of this AN proxy announcements, and they can still all uh, go to the same port, right? So we can, at the cost of a somewhat longer announcement, um, uh, boil down uh, to kind of a, instead of having a sequence of strings here or a more complex string, we break it up into multiple AN proxy announcements. And this is, this is what I'm saying here. I, I don't think we are completely through with this discussion, but uh, somehow this will go down, I think, into the list of simple strings here um, and then multiple of those announcements. And I just think I'll need to have a little bit more of a discussion with Michael on how this will end up exactly in GRASP so that he is happy with the encoding being as simple as possible. Um, yeah, so DNS SD, I think I, I already said that. Um, this was the, the optimization in terms of you just have um, in, for example, a registrar that supports PRM and uh, a classical Brewski RRM for both EST and CMP. That would just be those four strings without anything else in DNS SD. Obviously, we would update the services registry to indicate um, that uh, we have another registry that uh, is, is covering the details of these key values. I think we've got a question here. Please go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, just one question. Coming back to the default parameters that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so that means we don't have to signal anything if we use a default parameter. So you don't signal the default parameter if that's the only thing you would signal, right? Obviously, when you do support PRM and RRM, you must signal RRM because otherwise you can't distinguish um, mm -hmm. a registrar that only supports a PRM from a registrar that supports PRM and RRM. So, and I had that text, I think, in one of the prior slides. I may have uh, forgotten to come to that point. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, because uh, I, I was con concerned about uh, backward compatibility regarding yeah. existing implementations, and uh, that would basically save the, the existing implementations. Okay, exactly. thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so I haven't gotten to the point of encoding into co-op, so the whole point of constraint Brewski, constraint proxy, um, they are right now mostly an island of itself, but I would at, light, at least like to understand if or how we best map uh, any of these parameters into co-op discovery when um, uh, any future work or even existing work would like to do that so that uh, we get most value out of this. Right now, I don't see any, um, with the existing work, any conflict, um, but obviously it would be good to, to run through an example of um, how the variations could be used within co-op. So that's one TBD. Um, now, I was also thinking from my own experience of, of deploying these proxies and pledges and everything that diagnostics is, is a big problem. So if I look into, um, then um, if, if enrollment doesn't work, diagnostics is difficult anyhow. And by not having the information for the diagnostics, you don't make life easier, right? So pledges are difficult to diagnose, but if you're lucky, they're going to have some form of NVRAM or so where they capture a log. And if you go into the log and it says, oh, that stuff did fail, and you ask yourself, well, which proxy did you go to? Um, uh, to try to uh, get your enrollment, and it gives you some link local IPv6 address, which is what you get today. Uh, and that's not very helpful, right? So it would be very good if um, registrars and proxies would have a unique identity um, that uh, in diagnostics can be used to actually reproduce or isolate any, any type of problems. In the ANI, it's fine for the registrar because the registrar is identifying itself with the ACP address, which is bound to the certificate. So that's uh, unique and you know what it is. The proxy itself only has a link local address in um, the uh, GRASP announcement. When we use DNS SD with MDNS, for example, it can have, and it should have, and that's easy to write down, a um, service instance name. So it can have a string name, which could be you know, either a DNS name, or it could also be um, any type of other identifying string, like, for example, the um, serial number of the IDF ID, right? Um, in GRASP, we're missing that field. 
in Grasp right now, we don't have in the header a field other than the address you need to use to connect, which is a link local IPv6 address. So that basically means my, I mean, I, I wish we could fix this in Grasp, but I think, you know, changing anything in the headers, and we didn't make the header extensible um, in that respect. So unfortunately, if we want to have a service instance name, like, you know, the serial number um, or um, some global uh, address or DNS name, we'll probably have to put this um, into that objective um, uh, value as well. So making the objective value um, an array of two strings. One is the identifier, you know, that, that uh, we recommend to use uh, to identify the proxy. And uh, the second one being um, then the variation string. So that would get you to a parsing that says, well, it's either a string, and if it's an array, then it's basically, well, we could even say the first is the variation string, the second would be the identifier, right? So this is the encoding for, for diagnostics, and I always like to have good diagnostics. So it's kind of coming through walking through the actual deployment experience. Um, there is another issue which probably would need to go into a separate draft and would be independent. Um, when we walked through Brewski PRM, um, Brewski PRM had the nice idea of, um, uh, well, needs to discover the pledges. And so it dis prescribes two mechanisms to do it. One is you do know an identifier for the pledge and you're actually asking, um, you know, to discover just the network addresses of the pledge itself by calling the name uh, of the pledge. Um, but the other one would be, you're really trying to see which devices that are pledges are available on, on, the, on the network. So you're just asking for pledge. Um, and in DNS SD, we, we, we can do these things. Um, there is the interesting question, which is why the authors of Brewski PRM were kind of a, somewhat afraid of um, doing this, asking for which pledges are around because the subnet in question may be a mesh network uh, with radio connections. So it may be large and slow, and therefore you don't want to have, you know, a hundred answers um, coming at the same time. There are in um, DNS, uh, in, in MDNS RFC, there are um, various options on how to solve that. So for um, DNS SD, we simply um, need to make sure that Brewski PRM points to the right ones and maybe have one or two sentences to um, select those. So that type of text was already proposed. So that um, is hopefully fine. Um, in GRASP, we haven't pointed to any such mechanisms uh, to make discovery scalable in um, slow networks, right? Because we started uh, with GRASP, obviously, with um, you know faster networks and only over time exp expanded into the IoT space. So this might need to, to have something like a separate small dull grasp um, revision um, uh, RFC or so. Just wanted to mention that because obviously it would be lovely if we have grasp uh, not be something we cannot use because it's missing simply specification of obvious functionality. Brewski Cloud, I also went through that. And so when we have the variations, so this, this is maybe also simply a small text issue that, that I would suggest to add as a small paragraph to Brewski Cloud, which is that um, uh, the, the cloud registrar is redirecting um, to the owner registrar, but now if potentially in a, in a single cloud registrar, um, different um, type of devices that go to the same cloud registrar would require different variations of Brewski to perform the actual enrollment with the owner registrar, then it would be good just to be able to have for each of the different variations a different DNS name so that the Brewski cloud registrar could give a redirect to the fitting um, owner registrar because doing a discovery at that point in time is, is really, I think, uh, not really well working. There may be a URL redirect to a DNS SD name. I'm not sure if that exists, but usually you, you really only can do a redirect um, to um, a DNS name. Stefan, please go ahead. Oh, 
did you? Oh, he was just in the queue. Okay, sorry. It was uh, unintentionally. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So, so you know, but I've just been trying for for the whole discovery to make a somewhat uh, comprehensive run through through the top issues that that I could come up with. Right. So, um, I think this one is should be an issue easy to close. Um, so the next steps. So you know, I think the 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 two small issues I'll I'll open up against the individual draft. We can take them off. The, the registry with all its behavior. Um, so in my opinion, this is work ultimately that we agree to. We need to have discovery for Brewski PRM, Brewski AE, and for uh, the other uh, ones. So um, I think in the same way as we did with Yang in um, 8366, uh, this, um, we outsourced the Yang into a common document uh, so that uh, we get through the cluster that we have. Um, and I would think that it probably makes the most sense to also outsource uh, these variations, the registry ask and everything into a small separate um, draft slash RFC that is then referenced by the other documents. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Rob Alton Cisco. So um, uh, this might, might be a daft question, but going back to your slide six, you had a list of different options effectively in terms of, um, I can't remember the exact things, two selecting for first and, and things like that. So that one. My only question is, um, in terms of interoperability, mm -hmm. do you have a complete cross product of what different things can be supported? Or is an expectation that every implementation should at least support the ones you got marked down there as default? And hence, I know you're not going to be valid in terms of how it's deployed, but I just wonder if by having lots of different choices, it makes the things less interoperable because you might find you have um, PRM and CMP and, and CMS and another one doesn't or something like that. Well, it's, it's terrifying that we need more than one option, right? So it's kind of, you know, standards are so great, you can never have enough of them. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's just clear, you, you have an implementation and for each of these parameters, you're supporting one or more of the, the, the different variation, right? So, and um, when, when you're now talking about MTI, right? Mandatory to implement, right? Um, the way I see it is each of the RFCs that we have has an MTI. Okay. Right? So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it makes life in the future, the more variations we have, any more um, easier because everybody seems to want to have their uh, favorite combination, right? So right now we're still lucky and it seems just so that the, the, the number of uh, combinatorics that we have really is, is, is stick to, there's, there, there's pretty much one variation for, for, for every RFC that we have. But you know, at, at, uh, at this point in time, um, I'm starting to get worried that, you know, if people start, I mean, first of all, we can't discover them, right? So they discover them now. And um, then, then we had this, this point here that I was making, um, where is it, in which slide? Uh, but, but, no, sorry, let me find, to find the right slide. So here, PRM, RM, EST, and CMP, right? If, if, if you go for something like that, um, the worry, of course, is you're signaling these four, and then some implementer seems to think, well, you know, when I'm using registrar response mode, um, I'm, of course, doing EST, that's the old Brewski. And when I'm do, doing PRM, I'm doing CMP, right? So, but then now some fetch comes along and says, well, I wanted to have PRM, but with EST. And so I think exactly right. I think it's just the point you were making earlier. As long as it's very clear that if there's a minimum spec, for everything minimum set of versions that a process everyone is expected to su support, that improves interoperability because there's always like a, a common default that people can fall back on, even if they want to try and use or negotiate different things. No, not quite here. So, for example, I I I must not simply announce that I support PRM, RRM, EST, and CMP if I don't support arbitrary combinations. If I only support RRM with EST and PRM with CMP, then I need to create two separate announcements. One says RRM with the EST, 
RRM, EST, and the second announcement says PRM and CMP. And that's probably the example that I need to put in. If you actually support any combination, you have a single service announcement with all four. So my, my comment is not about okay. uh, capability exchange. Okay. My comment is about trying to make sure implementations are, are more likely to interrop by supporting the same sorts of things. That's, yeah. that's my, my comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we do have the MTI, um, but you know the way the industry goes, if, if, if somebody goes beyond the MTIs, you may end up with profiles which are vendor specific. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we were at the edge, uh, the end of that. Uh, so any more questions, suggestions? Stefan, um, you're again. So yeah, this time it was uh, real. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, one question is, um, if, if that one is to be uh, referenced by AE and, and PRM at least, then uh, might be a blunt question. Is that a normative reference? So does that mean we have, uh, a, a, yeah, we have to, to, to wait to, to, to this work is finished? Or is that something that can be done in the aftermath? Well, that, that, that's a good question. To, personally, as a contributor, I would say, I think it should be normative because I always think that, uh, you know, as I mentioned I, several times that discovery is a mandatory part for something in Anima, right? So otherwise it's manually configured. Um, and, and hopefully it's not going to be an issue because we close this and, and, and have something, you know, um, that, that, that is good um, by IATF 118, right? And okay. if we really feel that it would drag things along, then we need to have the discussion if we um, call this optional and informative too. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. But uh, I, I think given given the work that uh, you have done so far, uh, I don't think that uh, there, there will be a huge delay and I don't think that uh, the draft itself is overall much complicated. Yeah. No, I think okay. these, these, these other points, the, the cloud and dull or so, that, that will not go there. Um, that's just mm -hmm. the overall discovery issue, but not for what we dependency need for, for these RFCs just for their announcement discovery. So I think the main issue is for the discovery in Brewski to figure out what we do exactly with the string that Michael wants and that we feel confident that a single string is good enough and just a list of um, the uh, announcements so that we serialize multiple strings instead of trying to create a long combination yep. string. Um, and then the good write-up of the details that are hopefully already took the next step with these slides and kind of the example of the proxy. Um, so uh, I'm, 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 okay. I'm, I'm, I'm more or less speaking for, for AE here because uh, in PRM we have the normative dependency on RFC 8366 bis anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for AE it's it's basically clear to, uh, it's basically ready to go forward. So from, from that point of view, okay, but, but uh, point taken. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, sometimes, sometimes you have to, uh, to, to suffer the, uh, the cluster weight, so. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, then I think the slot is done and unfortunately the next slot, it's not going to be much different. Okay, so this is um, the work that I've been trying a couple times to progress. And um, so this is about um, Anima DNS SD services auto configuration. So something which could be used for Brewski, but is, is pretty much meant for, for any of the other services. And um, I'll, I'll talk about those details more. Um, so, uh, Last IETF, Sheng uh, was reminded we, we needed to have more reviews of, of that. So I, I reached out in private to a couple of folks, got some good response, but um, really with um, 
all this stuff being quite obscure, the, the primary amount of, of uh, answers I got was also related to uh, not understanding exactly why this is necessary, how this would work, um, and uh, if it would scale. So that's why I started to um, hopefully improve uh, well enough the explanation section in the beginning of the document, and I wanted to focus on uh, giving that um, explanation here also in the slot to make uh, the motivation hopefully um, unambiguously clear. And um, so the second draft was just uh, uh, no text changes, keep alive, and I'll quickly explain that as well. Um, so the whole point of this work is um, we need in Anima solutions that are really core Anima solutions, um, a DNS free service discovery and selection. We cannot and we do not want to require DNS for autonomic networks, right? So what we have in a real autonomic network is any to any um, client server discovery and selection without any centralized dependencies, right? That are manually configured, right? So that's one of the ultimate goals of any of the um, uh, things we've done for the ANI, right? Now, obviously, um, all of the protocols, Brewski um, and, and also GRASP, ACP not yet, um, but they're managed, they're also supposed to be used outside of the ANI. But when um, devices actually implement all these three protocols, you're supposed to be able to just plug them together, have secure connectivity and any type of automatically discovered services between them without any manually configured um, central site where you could host a DNS server or so, right? So that's basically why it's important to maintain and complete for an Anima solution um, service announcement discovery without DNS. Um, and that is really because for Unicast DNS server, nobody has found a good way enough to, to, to automate um, their auto configuration, right? Even if you look into the upcoming small home networks, uh, which all have DNS servers in them, but you want to start having redundancy failover, one of them fails, and you want to kind of have the state saved in the second one. Uh, those things are theoretically in thread. I'll still have to, I'm not going to hold my breath to see that, that really working well, right? I, I do understand in how, in large enterprises, how complex and how much manual operation the DNS system is. So um, that's why I certainly uh, think we, we must be sure that we have a DNS free option. Um, then there is MDNS, multicast DNS, which is working without central service. And when it was introduced uh, 10 years ago, there was the big hope that IP multicast would save the day and you can use MDNS in uh, larger scale networks. And they started out um, recommending that MDNS announcement were sent with a TTL of five. So five hops being a reasonably good uh, larger networks. Then a few years later, Apple started to have a lot and lot of applications that are using MDNS uh, and they got uh, deployed far and wide in schools and uh, public institution because of the, the way on how, especially in the education sector, Apple um, was and still uh, I think is quite dominant, and then everybody woke up to the fact that multi-hop uh, MDNS doesn't really work well. Um, and we had the same experience in our um, pre-standard implementations of uh, Anima, where we used multi-hop MDNS, and it's just missing the packet headers so that you can really well, um, without servers, uh, flood that stuff. So um, MDNS was really very much uh, reduced to a single hop subnet announcement mechanism and the IETF for all those existing networks where you do have actual unicast DNS servers have gone to solu hybrid solutions where on the edge of the network, you do have proxies between multicast MDNS and then unicast DNS. And those are for non-autonomic networks great, but they're just not good enough for an actual autonomic network, um, including you know any ad hoc deployments of mesh networks, in my opinion, where you really want to zero down on any uh, uh, manual configuration of central nodes. So GRASP was built in the ANI to solve this, right? Uh, it was one of the multiple goals of GRASP, um, and I think we did a fairly good job on that. Um, it is for layer three network-wide service announcement, discovery, and selection, um, and it avoids the MDNS problems because it supports network-wide flooding with loop prevention, um, and we're doing this simply by um, the same way as a 
uh, all the other reliable mechanisms like Usenet or others are working, we have a field called the session ID, which is the message sequence number. And uh, you're basically remembering some window of the last session IDs that you received. And when you receive it again, you're not going to flood it again. Um, and then per hop, we're using reliable transmission. So just because you're flooding doesn't mean you're starting to lose it because uh, it is hop by hop reliable and therefore um, also, um, you know, as especially very good end to end reliable. Um, Grasp right now, I think most people think it is tied to the ACP, which is a fairly uh, complex solution to, to introduce in your network. What we haven't done is to build out a small RFC saying, here's a very lightweight version on how to run Grasp in any existing mesh networks where it could equally compete with uh, a lot of the um, other mechanisms that are being used there, but that would be an easy thing to do. Um, so Grasp, uh, we think, would be highly valuable as such a reliable multi-hop um, autonomous service announcement discovery transport. Um, but we're actually on the way how the service announcements are done, missing pieces. And so this draft um, is not about um, uh, how to make Grasp easier to deploy, but what we're missing uh, so that we can use it in a way that has the same functionality as DNS SD. So with that, some, some quick background on DNS SD. Um, so for, for the work with service discovery, it's always good to use DNS SD as a reference in the IETF for what service discovery and selection really needs because that's the most widely service discovery mechanism, most widely proven and also most widely referenced in the IETF, of course, far beyond um, uh, anima, if you look at the service registry, that's all based on DNSSD, and you have hundreds of, of, of entries in that. So now DNS proper was not designed to support service discovery and selection. It's just a database. So the way on how DNSSD came into being is that Apple designed as part of Apple Talk, um, originally local talk, right? Apple Talk being on top of Ethernet then later on, the name binding protocol, which did introduce a fairly comprehensive um, set of functionality for service announcement, discovery, selection. Um, and so when they wanted to uh, get away from Apple Talk into a full TCP IP based solution, um, somewhat more than uh, 12 years ago, they basically created a good requirement RFC, what all the functionalities are from their, you know, I think at that point in time, more than 20 years of experience, local talk, Apple Talk for service announcement discovery. Uh, that's RFC 6760. Um, and then DNS SD was designed to meet those requirements. So the point was you have an abstract model of service announcement, uh, discovery and selection. And that abstract model, unfortunately, was never written down. That abstract model you can find in the APIs of DNS SD in, um, you know, uh, proprietary and any public implementation in terms of what API do I need to call to, um, uh, create a service, announce a service, discover a service, and you, you won't find any DNS elements in there. DNS is just a transport protocol, to, so to speak, to signal and build a database uh, for these service records, right? And so that actual, you know, mapping from the abstract service API to DNS is quite obfuscated because DNS is very fine-grained, so you need four or five different types of, of uh, resource records to describe a single service, which makes um, you know um, understanding, diagnosing, troubleshooting. I did a lot of that, um, quite complicated, and certainly not uh, something that is really nice on low-end systems. Now, obviously, you know, if you must do something, and you have run it long enough, this this becomes maybe natural. But obviously, um, in 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 many parts, especially autonomic networks or so would never be needed. So we certainly would be very well placed to have a much simpler solution. So if we look at what the API that, that is really not written down in, a, in an RFC is, a service description includes the service name, the service instance name, right? So you basically service name is printer and then service instance name is, you know, every printer has a different name that you gave it. Uh, the sockets, which are, you know, the, the protocol, TCP, UDP, port number, service instance and weight, um, 
the, sorry, service instance weight and priority, those are the selection parameters, right? So you can give services diff uh, instances different priority and the clients would select um, an instance with the highest priority and among those with the same highest priority, they'll uh, need to uh, randomly pick based on their weight so that you can have uh, one service instance that has, let's say, 10 times the performance, then you give it a weight of nine and a second uh, instance is a tenth of the performance, you give it a weight of one, something like that. Um, so I'm not going to explain um, all the convoluted wonderful things on how this information is encoded into the A, quad A, um, pointer, C name, text, and surf records. Um, so that's, that's exactly that complex stuff. Communication is then through MDNS and or unicast DNS. And uh, the selection is exactly, you know, weight and priority um, and, and the other details in the DNS SD RFC. So, so this is basically ultimately the type of service that we want to have in Anima, um, but where we wouldn't want to use, we cannot use MDNS and we don't want to use DNS unicast because we don't know how to automatically uh, create the servers and get them running. Sorry, and uh, sorry, the, I think the, the title line is wrong. So what, then when we look what GRASP has, right? So what is missing for DNS SD type of services in GRASP, right? So we pretty much have everything for the DNS SD API. Um, so uh, we have the service name, which is the objective name, right? So the objective name can be um, the service name, but right now we have specified our own registry for objective names, right? So just because there is a service and it has a service name, it's not good enough for graphs, you would need to re-register the same or a different service name. So that's unnecessary duplication of work. So the work in this draft is proposing that we have a subset of the objective names that are one-to-one -one mapped to any service name in the IANA service name registry. So you only need to register a name once and then you can use it with both DNS SD and you can use it with um, uh, with uh, GRASP. So we've got the service instance socket, so we've got the protocol and numbers, so we have that. Um, but what we're missing is we don't have the service instance name, right? So if we're announcing different printer, serv printer uh, uh, service instances, they're all going to have an objective name of printer, but uh, you, we don't have a standardized field in the GRASP header to say here is the name, the service instance name. So every service would have to come up with its own mechanism. And that of course means we don't have a consistent way to do that. Likewise, the service instant weight and the priority and uh, all these parameters, the key value pairs that we already talked about in Brewski, right? So any of these details, every um, service announcement in GRASP would currently have to redefine on its own, right? So seems clear that we want to have within the GRASP framework a standard on how all type of service announcement could do it equally. Um, and then also for the communication, you need to discover not only the service, but you also need to discover a service instance. Um, so that's also not specified. So and the draft is pretty much um, all about solving only the gaps on this slide, right? So it's basically trying to expand GRASP so that a subset of GRASP object objectives can be exactly um, service um, uh, objectives that are exactly allowing you to have all the same parameters as DNS as these services announce and discover them um, right um, so what are the target benefits and what's the scope of this, right? So the whole idea is to, and I'll have one slide that shows how it looks like. So make this a sample to do service announcement discovery without having to know the GRASP details, right? So as soon as you have a simple SDK, it would be the same type of SDK you have for, S for DNS SD today. It could even be the same SDK and the SDK itself um, determines automatically if it should use DNS SD MDNS or if it should use GRASP, right? So if it's on an ACP, ANI or any other, if it discovers that GRASP is available, it would simply use GRASP instead of DNS SD. So, and, and so the application doing the service announcement discovery wouldn't even have to use it. 
uh, wouldn't have to uh, know which protocol is used. So um, we're inheriting all the, the IANA registry, and we can also ultimately um, build service proxy. So one of, one of the things you could do is, um, and I'm going to get to that later on, you have in a, um, in a NOC, you have servers that are announcing themselves by MDNS, and you're converting that into um, GRASP um, so that the GRASP, the uh, ACP ANI network can actually discover a service that have announced themselves by DNSSD and uh, where the service announcement is simply translated automatically. And that actually, the, the, the pre-standard um, implementation that we did, we're doing something along exactly these lines. Um, now, we don't want to do everything of DNSSD, so the main issue is that it's good enough, in our opinion, to, to deal with a single flat network, which in DNSSD is called the dot .local network, right? Uh, not to discover or announce uh, hierarchical into the whole uh, DNS domain, but just, uh, you know, every instance is its own dot .local, which can be as large as an enterprise ACP or which can be as small as some mesh network. So and here is how it looks like. So on the right-hand side, you see an example, um, grasp encoding of a single service announcement. Um, I guess I could have done a comparison of all these aspects uh, across uh, multiple um, DNS uh, resource records, which uh, would look a lot more complicated. If you see under RFC XXXX, so that would be just the tag. These are all the parameters. The service itself would be the syslog service. Um, and the way to indicate that this is an actual service name, it has kind of the keyword SRV in front of it. And then really um, we have um, the, um, the service, We've got the instance, which is the instance name, priority weight, KV pairs uh, we can put in there. And then one of the beauties of doing flooding in the network is we can now do discovery based on expanding uh, ring search, right? So something that um, people in networks always like to have, you'd uh, like to find the closest server, which is not possible with unicast DNS, and which is where you know all these unicast-based DNS solutions struggle with a lot of X they're trying to figure out where do you come from. I need to know the whole network topology so I can uh, uh, redirect you to a server that is close to you. Because we're hop by hop flooding, it's very simple to do the flooding limited to, to a number of hops. Um, and uh, so there is a, another loop count. I'm not going to explain the details of how that uh, scope limited um, uh, flooding is done, but this is exactly in support of that. So this is all the information you need. It's one message. It's being flooded. It can be constrained flooded, three, four, five, six hop, however long you want. Um, so uh, that way, um, I think we're going to have a very simple solution that is then fully compatible with a DNS SD as far as a service interface is concerned. Um, right, so that, that was the DNS SD. And why did I start to do this? Well. The reason why I started to do this is because I think we wanted to complete the ANI um, in conjunction, use ANI, all the good stuff we did in Anima for existing networks, which are being managed, um, orchestrated from some central sites with operators using CLI or controllers using NetConf, uh, NetMod, Yang, SSH, all the good things. Um, and they have a bunch of services that actually need to um, collaborate with the network very early on before you know a controller can take over right so today a controller is only taking over after some initial steps are happening um, and that is exactly we need to have time across right the time needs to be synchronized even for all the security to work right certificates have uh, 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 time limits so if all your routers are starting up with first January 1970 you're not going to get security working the second one is syslog, right? If anything happens, especially when something happens that you didn't predict, you need to know it in the central side. So how do you find a syslog server, right? So you need to find the syslog server so that all the devices in the network can even start to deliver you logging information that you know what's going on. And then if you want to remotely access CLI or from a controller devices, you need to have authenticated access. And 
yeah, we can try to do it through certificates, try to ask operators how successful they've been with that. They really like to have their role-based access control, which comes from radius, uh, tech X or diameter, and you need to discover these servers. And that's yet another core infrastructure service that autonomically booting devices with Brewski need as the next step so that they can be remotely managed. And then, of course, as soon as you have operators and you do have a central DNS system, you also need to discover the DNS servers. And that, too, cannot be done by DNS before, right? So that's kind of pulling yourself out of uh, the mud, right? So these are very few services that need to be discovered so that uh, autonomic devices can auto-configure themselves to the point where then a controller or operator can take over. And that's pretty much what this draft does. The whole model is described already in RFC 8368. Um, and so this, um, these two drafts that I'm proposing uh, we adopt is exactly closing this up, right? So it's basically allowing you to finally have everything needed so that uh, one of our two reference uses of, of the Anima architecture as described in 8368 can be fully realized. Um, right, and I think somewhere, right, so the, 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 the thing that, that ESCO brought up was about the scalability, right, so, and um, so I've started to write this down here, so the next ref I'm, I'm doing soon is going to cover that, so I have seen a lot of, you know, people trying to use flooding things to flood thousands, tens of thousands of services, and obviously that doesn't scale, right? So as soon as you get into a really large number of services, you need to have databases that, you know, uh, out of band put the information. So we need to provide clear and crisp guidance of how far you can do the flooding through large networks, right? And I think we can come up with fairly useful um, rule of thumbs for that. Um, and uh, so I don't want to necessarily bother you with the details here at this point, but um, I think that's certainly well taken as, as a key aspect that's still missing in the description, which I will add. And yeah, that, that was it. So thank you very much for your time. Um, Sheng. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, without much here, uh, hat on. I think this work is um, useful, and um, I encourage you to uh, go further. And but with my chair hat on, uh, I think you, you need to work more discussing, uh, get more uh, reviews. Um, also, your claim you have some private uh, discussing yeah. and reviewers. Uh, they need to come to public. I would like to say them in the mailing list. You know, uh, if there are enough interest in from working group, we can consider yeah. to uh, co adoption. Right? Yep. Of course. Anybody else? Okay, yep, yeah, please. Uh, if, if you have any further comments, questions, or so, go to the list or so. I'm happy for all feedback. All right, then I think we uh, come to the last uh, presentation of the day. Um, that would be uh, Lee Yan. Is that, is he, is he here? I see a video. Um, I don't see a. Uh... Can you can you try to say something? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, not very good. If you can get closer to the microphone, that would help. Try again. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, speak out loudly, and then um, do you want uh, 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 us to share the slides, or do you want to share the slides yourself? Move them forward. I mean, maybe bring up this, the slides here, um, and then follow what uh, 
Karsten was saying. So, so now Karsten yeah. said there is a button where I can pass control. Let's see, event map, notification, and. Oh, you can control it for me. Okay, I will do. Okay, just tell me next slide when you need it. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I will introduce Brook CLE, a certificate NIS enrollment protocol uh, in Brookski. The next page. Uh, IoT devices have been widely used in various scenarios, such as smart city and smart health care. Take smart medical care in the hospital as an example. In this scenario, an IoT device accesses the hospital's network through the gateway. An authentication center is responsible for issuing credentials to the IoT device and the gateway. Thus, they can use the credential to authenticate each other. In this scenario, the gateway cares about whether the IoT device is legitimate rather than who is the IoT device. Therefore, if X.509 certificates are used in the authentication, the identity information in the certificates is redundant. The authentication mechanisms for IoT devices should be lightweight and uh, scalable, as IoT devices are commonly resource constrained and have a huge number. Uh, the next page. Yeah, there are many three existing authentication mechanisms based on asymmetric cryptography. Photography. Uh, X.509 certificate, uh, raw public key, and identity based cryptography. A certificate is a commonly contained in a certi certificate chain. A certificate chain is, uh, has three certificates at the least. And entity certificate, C certificate, and root certificate. A non certificate chain needs to measure volumes of transmitted data and a non verification time. Thus, certificate based authentication is not lightweight. The raw public key lacks scalability, uh, scalability because the peer's public key must be obtained via an out-of-band out method previously. In IBC, the device's private key is generated by an authentication center. This method is not secure. However, IBC is lightweight and scalable. The identity is also the public key in RBC, and there is no need to make out-of-band configurations. Next page, please. Uh, yeah, cert certificate in this uh, cryptography it was uh, proposed to deal with the key escrow limitation in RBC. The user obtains the full private key by combining the partial private key with a secret value. The partial private key is generated by a trusted third party. Inherited from IBC, certificate is cryptography is also lightweight and scalable. The user's public key derives from the user's identity in this draft. Uh, the next page, please. Bruce key is an excellent uh, automated bootstrap pro 
protocol. And there are five phases in the um, bootstrapping process of uh, the pledge. This draft focuses on the enrollment phase and the phase after enrollment. All existing enrollment protocols use a CA to issue local certificates to the pledges. After enrollment, the pledge uses the local certificate to authenticate each other. The next page, please. Uh, Bruce Key CLE is a lightweight enrollment protocol for constrained IoT devices. A public key based credential replaces the certificate. Uh, AC replaces the CA to issue the credentials. A mutual authentication protocol is proposed to show the usage of the credential in the authentication after enrollment. The next page. Please. Compared with the certificate authentication, certificate needs authentication improves more than 50% of computational capability and about 80% of transmission capability. And the next page, please. And the only change in architecture is that the CA is replaced by the AC. It is assumed that the AC and the registrar can authenticate each other. Uh, the next page, please. Uh, in, in the in initial phase of the enrollment protocol, the registrar says the I dev ID of the pledge on the alarmist in the CA. Then the pledge requests the public key and the credential from the CA in sequence. Next page, please. Uh, in the mutual authentication protocol, the client and the server make the credential exchange and the proof of position exchange in sequence. Uh, next, next page. Uh, okay, that's all. Uh, any question? Please go ahead, Michael. Um. So it seems that you basically reinventing um, Coast Web Token. And so I wondered if you'd looked at any of the work in the COSI working group um, for that, and also most of the ACE architecture. Uh, yeah, um, please, uh, the next page. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, compared with ASOS, uh, we oriented a different scenario. ASOS, uh, in ASOS, a uh, token is used by a client to request resources from a server. Uh, but in Bruce CLE, uh, the usage usage of the credential is more general. Uh, the pledges action after the authentication using credentials is not specified. Uh, and, uh, kind so there's of more than just ACE OAuth. There, there's, there's a whole ACE framework. OAuth is just one aspect of using ACE. Um, but in any case, it uses um, COSI web tokens um, which is more general than ACE OAuth. Uh, yeah, in the ACE framework, the, uh, the format of the token is not specified. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, any the form of the token is 
okay in the ACE film, framework. Well, I just don't think we should reinvent new crypto uh, mechanisms in the animal working group. I think we need to use what what's out there already. And I'm pretty sure that what you've written um, could be can be expressed in the form of closey um, objects. So uh, I would really suggest you take a deep look at that because I, I think that is a useful way. And uh, it's already being do, done by quite a number of of uh, uh, of organizations already um, so I don't think we should reinvent it um, and the enrollment part is also there's an ACE EST effort right now that essentially does the same thing so I really think you should look at that and um, I, I don't think this comparing to ACE OAuth is enough of a, a deep enough under comparison Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I will do a deeper comparison uh, in a draft uh, in the future. Stefan? Yeah, I, I had a question that I think I posted that question also on the mailing list. Um, the cryptographic approach that you are using there, you, you wrote that this is based on the Schnorr signatures. Uh, but that there are some deviations that, that you came up with in the draft. And uh, I wasn't quite sure. Was there any any uh, verification that this approach is, uh, from a security perspective, sound? Well, that was the reason to to point to the CRFG Crypto Forum Research Group for basically asking them to have a review about the general security approach, despite the the uh, things that Michael just mentioned regarding uh, potentially reinventing the wheel if something was already being done in the ACE framework. Uh, regarding uh, yeah, authentication or authorization of, of uh, utilizing web tokens. But, but my, my uh, initial question essentially is, was there any kind of verification regarding the security of the approach utilizing uh, parts of the public-private keys from, from the AC uh, when issuing credentials to a pledge or to a to client? Uh, yeah. Uh... Uh, we are we are plan to um, make uh, the um, make the uh, make, uh, make the uh, create person um, the algorithm to uh, uh, to other groups uh, the the security proof uh, it can be introduced in the future version of the draft, uh, we, we have done some uh, security proof. Um, mm. uh, if, if this is generally applicable as a, as a uh, approach for authorization, so it may be good to, to talk to CRFG. Uh, so this is not something which is only applicable for for enrollment. Uh, yeah, yeah, we we are going to uh, the working group C, uh, CRFG uh, to promote uh, the uh, the algorithm. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. So it, it, it sounded as if um, certainly feedback from CFRG with respect to this is a crypto with distinct properties that the existing doesn't have would, would be, I think, a good thing to get, right? If, if that's the case, what you're trying to do, right? That, that this is a specific new type of crypto. And then um, ACE with respect to getting an understanding from ACE that it is solving problems that ACE doesn't solve 
um, equally well, right? So I think those 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 would be two two steps that that would help to make progress with the work because if uh, you know a CFRG would say that uh, this doesn't make sense, right? Or that ACE, as I think Michael is claiming, can do all the same things here already, right? Then I think those those would be challenges to overcome. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there anything more on the uh, other slides that you had? That what did you, you have more backup slides? Uh, that's uh, all. Okay. Good. So, um, if there is nothing else, then I think I'd like to hand off to Sheng to uh, close the meeting. Everyone, uh, hopefully see you all in Prague. Yeah, we are ending the meeting and the end of the session for today. Thank you. See you. Thank you. have the two-year contract for you here? <laughs> uh, you're not going to want that. I'm, I'm a crappy note taker. And I, oh, I also sorry. didn't catch your answer. Did this was it's fine. I will, for, for, for the things that I, I did, that's oh, oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Sure. So um, this is already, I, I can just close this tab, right? So you can do on this and maybe cut the, yeah. I don't even know what that is. But I always click on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Yeah.